Thomas Young, super genius, British guy, turn of the 19th century. He says to himself, hey, I know that when I'm sitting back listening to some Bach on my nice Bose speakers, and I am exactly, well, like when I'm right in between them, and it's just playing a single note, then I hear it loud when I'm right here, and if I go up here a little bit more, I can hear it loud again, but there's a location in the middle when it's totally silent. I don't mean just quiet, but I mean totally silent, and he knew that was because sound was a wave, and if you're playing a certain note, if you happen to be where the point, where like the difference in path length, I could call it delta L, is equal to one half of a wavelength, which means this guy has traveled one half of a wavelength more than the sound from this guy has traveled, then you're going to get completely destructive interference. He already knew all of that stuff, and see, he set out he set out to try to find a way to see this in light, and that was a tremendous idea. Light's got a very interesting history. See, Newton, 1600s, thought that light was a particle, and he actually had a cool name for them. He called them corpuscules, yeah, of light. And then uh, it was a little bit after that, what, 150 years later, something like that, Young showed the entire world that light was a wave. And it wasn't until quantum mechanics, and we're talking about, I don't know, 1905 to 1925 or so, put a nine in there, 1925, that we realized that it's kind of both and you better deal with it. But it's interesting that it started out as a particle and then everybody was like, no, it can't be a particle, that's ridiculous. And then we had to prove the particle characteristics of light later on, so that's fun. But let's focus back on destructive interference and constructive interference. We found that if delta L was some multiple of the wavelength where M is an integer, you can write integers like that, that's the set of all integers, some positives, some negatives, but nothing like three halves or something like that. So this guy is constructive and if I multiply this by m, ooh, what are this? I'm going to put m over 2. Sure, if I have an integer divided by 2, number of wavelengths, that's called a half integer wavelength. Or I could write, um, what's another cool way to write it? I could write it like this. I could write m minus a half times the wavelength. That's probably the way that we're going to write it. If this is the case, then we get destructive interference, then we get constructive interference if it's that way. So let me set up Young's experiment for you. He took a light bulb, or maybe it was a lantern. We're talking about way before any, uh, <clears throat> way before any, what's that guy's name? Edison. Thomas Edison was making, oh, another Thomas though. Thomas Edison, Thomas Young, they should have hung out together. But they did not overlap their lifespans. So he took a light bulb, and it was probably a lantern, and it definitely didn't have a screw base, but I'll just draw you a light bulb right now. And he took a lantern, and in front of it, he put a red filter because he did not want multiple colors of light. He knew that you had to have the same frequency of light for this to work. So this is a solid red filter, only allowing some very red light to get through. And then he took a... Uh, a collimating thing. This is like a um, this is a sheet of cardstock or something, and he only let a line of light get through it. So like right here was the line of light. That meant that all the light was getting through it was a tiny little slit. So this is a single slit. But then that meant that all the light was nice and lined up. And so that was the way he made sure that it was coherent and monochromatic was with the filter. So all the lights all together and everything's cool. And then he took this second piece of cardstock paper or something and he set it up like this. He said, okay, in here, we're gonna have two paths that the light can choose to go through. I'm framing this in a very interesting way so that you'll be able to think about this when we go on in physics. But light came through the filter, came through this single slit, and then chose which of these two slits to go through. The cool thing is, each of these slits then created, by Huygens' principle, it created its own set of waves. So you've got waves coming out of this guy, spherical waves, mind you, but they kind of look cylindrical here. And then you've got waves coming out of here, and waves coming out of there, and waves coming out of there. And essentially, this wave interferes with that wave. So now I'm going to switch to a top view. A long way away from this two-slit thing, well, here's the two-slit thing. It's right here. 
and a long way away from it, he had a screen. And on that screen, an interesting pattern emerged. The screen was where the light could go. So you remember, of course, that he's going to be getting these waves coming out from here, and they're each circular, right? Each, well, circular cross-section, but really they're spherical waves. And uh, we're not going to line up all that stuff again. I just want to do a tiny bit of <clears throat> geometry with you, maybe some trig also. He called the separation between the two slits D, because he was British, and that stands for distance, I guess. So that's the separation between the center of one slit and the center of the other slit. And then he studied a normal line. So he had this line that came out normal to the blockage, normal to that cardstock sheet, and he had another one coming out here. And he said, what if light comes out at this angle? Let's just call it theta. That angle right there is theta. And there's other light coming out from here. Remember, the screen is really far away. Really far away. In fact, it's so far away that if light's hitting a single point, this is a little bit of an approximation, but I'm saying that light from this is hitting this point way over here, and light from this one is also hitting that point right there. So these two rays converge, of course, at infinity if they're parallel. Yep, they're parallel, and they're going to converge at infinity, and I'm saying that screen is at infinity. I don't really mean at infinity, I mean like a couple meters away, whereas this separation might be a micrometer or something. This is something like, what do I want to say, D is something like 10 to the negative 6 meters. Wow, those slits were really close to each other. Okay, the closer the slits are to each other, the more diffraction we're going to get, <coughs> as we'll see in a moment. But here's my point. My point is, if you can believe that these two parallel lines will meet at the screen, then I want to draw a normal line to the ray. This line right here is the really important line. It's normal to the ray, so that implies that this angle here is also theta. Are we agreed? The interesting distance for us is this one right here. This distance right here is the additional length that the light from this slit has to travel before it is in line with the other ray. So after this, these guys have exactly the same length that they have to travel to get to the screen. So this is the difference between their two lengths. So I'll put a little arrow here and say, from here on, the lengths are exactly the same. So the difference in lengths is right here. I'm going to call that delta L. Can we define delta L, the path length difference? Now here's the thing. This is D, that's theta, this is a right angle, my homies. So I'm going to say that this is the opposite side. It looks like delta L then is simply D times the sine of theta. We have just derived the most important equation in diffraction. Th frankly, I think it's the most important equation in physical optics as a whole. So here's what you need to understand about this delta L. If the path length difference is d times sine theta, and if we go back to our previous slide where we said something about path length difference, remember we were arguing that if the path length difference is some half integer, of the wavelength, then we get destructive interference. And if the path length difference is some integer wavelength, then we get constructive interference. Well, now we can make that statement a little bit stronger. Now I can say if d sine theta is my path length difference, that's the length that this guy has to travel, different from the length that this guy has to travel, which is just this distance right here. If delta L is d times sine theta, then we can say, well, let's get ourselves a little bracket because we've got kind of two options here. If it's equal to, let's see, if it's equal to m minus a half times the wavelength, then we will not have any light because one of them's at a peak while the other one's at a trough and vice versa. And I guess they're both at the midpoint exactly the same time. So these waves will cancel out always if d sine theta is some half integer of a wavelength. This is destructive. There's a song about that. And if d sine theta is m times the wavelength, then we have constructive interference all the time. My point is this. We can now say 
that if we, oh man, you want a pretty picture? I'm about to give you a pretty picture. Here we go, we got a slit here and a slit here and rays are coming through and they're all like whoop, 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 whoop. Whoop. And it's very complicated, and geometrically, it's a nightmare if you try to draw this. You do not want to try to draw it, but here's the result. The result is that along this line, and along this line, and along that line, we get ourselves fringes. They're called bright fringes. So it's bright here, and it's bright here, and it's bright here. Here, this corresponds to m equals one. No, m equals zero, because the path length difference between this slit and that slit is exactly zero right there. So of course we have a bright fringe. This is the central bright fringe. And then we've got a bright fringe down here. I guess this guy corresponds, what are we gonna say, the angle's negative? I guess we can. So this corresponds to m equals negative one. And up here, this is m equals positive one, and m equals two. This is our first quantum number. It's describing which level we are at the angle. Boy, oh boy, that's gonna be exciting. Now, here's the issue. We also have dark fringes, and they exist right in between the bright fringes. So there's a dark fringe right here where there's actually no light at all hitting. It doesn't mean it's always a trough. That doesn't mean anything at all. It means there's no oscillating electric field. There's no oscillating magnetic field. In the case of sound, remember we have this complete perfect analogy with sound. In the case of sound, this is the average pressure of the room the whole time. But at the place where we're calling it bright, that's a loud sound. So bright means a loud sound. You could hear a lot here. That means that you're getting really high pressure, and then really low pressure, and then really high pressure, and the frequency at which it's changing the pressure determines the frequency of the sound that you hear. So this is a dark fringe, this is a dark fringe, this is a dark fringe over here. And these dark fringes, ooh, the dark fringes, this is m equals zero for the dark fringes. And the dark fringe is m one here because it's halfway in between the bright fringe m equals zero and the bright fringe m equals one. So here's m equals two for the dark fringes. Destructive means dark fringes and constructive means bright fringes. We'll do that in green. And now you've earned it, so I will show you some cool results. Ta-da, watch this. This is a small sheet of plastic that has been grooved with thousands of slits in it. And I can prove that the following way. I've got myself a brand new, where is it? Mm-hmm, I've got myself a brand new purple laser pointer. Check this out. There it is right there. I'm gonna turn off the lights and make this a little more interesting. So there it is, and I'm planning to show you how the light goes through here, and it is no longer just a single beam, it will be Lots of beams, oh cool. So through those slits, and we'll see exactly what additional slits do, but through those slits, I'm getting a whole bunch of dots. And the angle of separation between them, look at this, I can move the laser pointer forward and back. Sorry, if I move the laser pointer forward and back, I should not, dang it. <laughs> I should not be noticing any change, but I definitely am noticing a change, so that's kind of frustrating. So if I move the laser pointer forward and back, I should not notice a change. There we go. Now I'm moving it forward and back a lot and I'm not noticing a change. The problem is, if I, I'll show you what the problem was. As I'm going to different regions in this, I'm getting all kinds of weird bending, like the plastic is not uniform. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah, that is really weird. Oh, also, yeah, I'm going forward and back and I'm at an angle, that's probably why it is. So if I try not to be at an angle, if I move forward and back, I get very little change in the separation. Now that's with, wait a second, isn't wavelength related to frequency? Let's see if we can say the speed of light is frequency times wavelength. So wavelength must be the speed of light divided by the frequency, right? So that's a very high frequency. So it means it's a very short wavelength. What if we try something that's more like green? What are you expecting with green? I guess we'd get a little bit more splitting. Yeah, a little bit more splitting with green. And we go like this, forward and back, and we don't get much of an effect. And, uh, and that's really cool. Here's something else that's cool with this. I can get reflections, and I can get bending as it goes through. So I can even make this really neat circle. I think this is pretty cool. Do you think this is cool? I think it is. Well, whatever. Maybe you don't, maybe you do. Going through, not going through. Check that out, yep, 
Mm-hmm, single dot, lots of dots, cool. Those are bright fringes, and right in between the bright fringes are the dark fringes. That's pretty neat. Now, what if I go to an even better diffraction grating? That's what this is called. Yeah, it's got so many, look at that! Wow, that's amazing. That is incredible. Check it out. Mm-hmm, and you can get some reflection and some refraction. That's really beautiful. And I could also, I could go to red. Now, red's got a really, really low frequency, so a really, really big wavelength. And if I go to my equations, remember my equations say something about d times the sine of theta. Wow, you can't even see that, especially with the light off. d times the sine of theta is equal to m times lambda. That means the spacing the spacing has something to do with like the sine of theta, right? So the sine of theta is sort of like lambda divided by d. Ooh, interesting. And maybe we need an m up here, but we can kind of put it in parentheses and say, if I'm just looking for the spacing, then I guess the bigger the wavelength that I have, the bigger the spacing I'm gonna get. And the closer the lines are, the bigger the spacing I'm gonna get. So I'm gonna get this guy here that's red. Big wavelength, right? And I'm gonna get these here, this d is really, really small, Boom! Look at how much those are spaced. You can't even see them when I go up here. Wow, that, so I guess you get pretty bored if you can't see them. But look at that. These are bent so incredibly much here that you can only see three dots at the maximum. And I frankly can't get you any more of them unless, can I possibly? No, you can only see three because they're bent so much. Wow, cool. And then finally, I have this really amazing sheet of stuff that I found, whoa. I found, here, I'll turn the light on for this. I found this stuff inside of a monitor. Look at what it does to the text as I lift it up from the text. What? Fascinating. And so you can ask yourself, what would this do if there were a green light shining through it? And here we are. It turns out that that green light is then spread into a line. And look at those two bright points. So this must be some sort of a diffraction grating. Sorry, my laser's kind of flaking out on me a little bit. There we go, we see it nice and dim now. There are those two bright points. But if we can get it to be all the way on again, there, now you see that nice line. And I can make this form a full circle like that, which I think is really pretty. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you try to figure out what it is and how it works. Reflection. Uh-huh, diffraction, yeah, beautiful. So we are entering some really interesting stuff and we're just about to get to some great physics. So stay with me, see ya.